Okay, so we uh, are in Romans, and we are looking at Romans chapter 6 now. So, mystical union, uh, this is the union between uh, uh, the believer, uh, the Christian, and Jesus, right? So, this is uh, that mystery that happens between us, that unites us with God, right? So this mystical union is possible when uh, we are justified, our sins are washed away. Uh, so when, you know, Paul says that the Holy Spirit lives in us. Uh, and Paul will be now talking about this mystical union in detail. Well, he started this Romans, this epistle, by saying that everybody... Uh, Everybody is a sinner, right? Everybody needs Jesus. And that the wrath of God is coming. Judgment is coming. So to be saved, you need Jesus. Only Jesus can save you. And then he makes a very strong case for saying that what saves you, it's not outwardly uh, or outward uh, uh, sign, but uh, it's your faith. And, uh, for example, when he talks about Jews... Uh, so, say in chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 27, he says, Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the latter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So this is, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, revolutionary, because if you say that circumcision, which is, uh, of course, something that circumcision... Did I spell it correctly? Yes. yes. Okay, circumcision. So it's a sign of the covenant, right? And it is done by people. So it's visible, visible sign. So it's visible sign. So it's a visible sign. Circumcision is visible <coughs> sign. But now Paul says that it doesn't matter if you are circumcised or uncircumcised. What matters what is in your heart? What matters is what is in your heart. And then he will later say it's faith. Because when he talks about Jews, so in chapter 4 he says that Abraham was justified by faith. And then chapter 4, he uh, say verse 9. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or, or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. Which means that first Abraham had faith, and only after that came circumcision, right? So Paul, in various ways, he says, well, <laughs> you are a Jew spiritually. You don't need to have a circumcision. And by Jew, he means you have covenant with God. You are connected to God. And then he says, Abraham had faith before he was circumcised. or He was connected to God. So it wasn't circumcision. Circumcision was important. It was the sign of the covenant. But this is not what matters, what counts. What counts is faith. Because on account of his faith, he was counted as righteousness, as righteous. He was counted as righteous on account of his faith. Uh, that is important because it brings us to the question of baptism. Because circumcision was commanded, right? Circumcision was commanded. So you had to circumcise your uh, male, you know, uh, infants. Uh, you had to circumcise them. It was commanded. But at the same time, it's not the circumcision that saves. Uh, circumcision is important, but... There is something spiritual, something invisible, something in your heart. So he says that you can be circumcised spiritually without being circumcised physically. So now for us, if we draw parallels with baptism, 
it's interesting because then baptism is important, it's commanded, and something is happening in baptism, but at the same time, it's not the baptism that saves you, it's faith that saves you, right? So, for example, we are doing now the Gospel of Mark. We are going over the Gospel of Mark, and if you go to the last chapter of Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, so it's the Great Commission, Jesus uh, says something to the apostles. He says, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And then verse 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So when we have this formula, when we have uh, baptism and faith, you are saved. But if you don't have faith, you are condemned. So you may have still baptism, but you don't have faith, you are condemned, right? So, and Luther, in his large catechism, he uh, develops this idea. He says, if you are baptized as an infant, you know, a seed of faith is planted in you, but then you need to make sure that uh, that seed grows, right? So the new Adam or new person in you grows. If it doesn't grow, if the old Adam takes over, then Luther says your baptism is empty sign or barren sign, right? So now why would Luther say, well, your baptism is empty sign or barren sign? Because there is no faith. There is no living faith. So how can you make your baptism, uh, how can you reconnect to your baptism so that it's not empty sign through repentance, right? So you need to bring people to faith, right? And faith comes from hearing the word of God. So now, again, faith is something invisible. Baptism is something visible, right? Circumcision is something visible. Faith, uh, and Paul uh, uh, talks about this, is invisible. Do, do, do you see parallels? So, but that's very interesting because it's, uh, it's, it's revolutionary because many people think and thought in times of Paul that uh, you are circumcised, you are fine, you are with God. We are children of Abraham, so. And Paul and Jesus and Paul after him would say, no, 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 you are not fine if you don't have faith, you know, living faith. So this is something very important. So now let us go to our chapter 6 now and uh, look at this. A uh, little bit closer. There is another topic that Paul is talking about a lot. He talks about grace. He says, you have faith, now your sins are forgiven. So God shows you your grace. And then in chapter 6 he says, verse 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it. So this is very important. This is very interesting. Many people think, okay, we understand that the gospel is about grace. Grace is something that we, um, um, something that we didn't deserve, but we, 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 we receive it. We do not deserve righteousness, but we receive it. And Paul talks a lot about grace. We, you know, because we believe in Jesus, we are now in His grace. We are in His grace, right? So this is something that we do not deserve, but we receive it. So now, the, the biggest mistake is when people think it's a license to sin. So because God loves me, because I'm forgiven, because He shows me grace, then I can live as I lived, or even worse, I can do whatever I want, and then God will forgive me anyway. Because, you know, I'm baptized, or because I profess my faith in Him. And Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So the more sin we commit, the more grace God shows us. So does it mean that we should commit more sin so that God gives us more grace. And Paul says, no way. There should be transformation of our lives. 
So, and here I want to bring something very important to you. So, um, Christians are connected to Christ, and we have sinful nature. Jesus has sinless or perfect nature. We have this mystical union, and then something happens. When we connect to Jesus, two things happen. One is legal, so to speak, and that is justification. And the best uh, illustration of this would be the courtroom. And uh, so you are a criminal, and then God is the judge, and then the judge pronounces his fair judgment, and you cannot pay, you know, because you cannot. Your sin is too big, right? And then the judge takes off his robe, judge's robe, and then he joins you and pays for you. So this is legal, right? Everything is happening in the courtroom. This is justification. Okay, so we are forgiven because Jesus died for us, you know. God the Father pronounces his fair judgment. We uh, are supposed to be destroyed, right, because of that. But then Jesus pays for us and he dies instead of us. So this is legal aspect of this. But there is also a medical component to this, and medical in quotation mark, which uh, involves our transformation. We are supposed to be transformed. We are supposed to be changed. Our minds should be renewed. We need to think in a different way. Our lifestyles are supposed to change. Uh, so we are supposed to change, right? So it's, I call it or theologians call it like medical aspect. And that would be like transformation, renewal, or change, right, of our nature. So now, if the Lord forgives you, it doesn't mean that you should keep sinning or living your sinful lifestyle. He forgives you, but now because you are his child, you need to live godly life. He is transforming you. He liberates you from your sinful desires. Uh, he gives you this desire to live new life. You want to live to please the Lord, right? You will fail, and then you will come to him and ask for forgiveness. But still, there is transformation, right? And this is what Paul is talking about in this chapter, in chapter 6. Look what he says. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Right? So we need to resist sin. There should be like healthy desire to resist sin, right, in our lives. So if I was, a, uh, for example, if I was a, a, a fornicator or a drunkard or a thief, right, when I come to Christ, I'm supposed to change, right? So I'm supposed to be trying. I cannot just say, well, you know, my sins are forgiven legally but I will keep doing what I'm doing, right? So, do you not know, Paul continues in verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Okay? Newness of life. So this is transformation. This is not just justification. This is not just a, a legal aspect. You're forgiven, and that's all. So you also, we also are supposed to be transformed, and we are supposed to walk in the newness of life. So, and, and, and this is what we're saying, that God gives us new heart, new feelings, everything new. We receive all the new... Uh, all, all the new uh, things from him. Now, Paul, Paul goes a little bit deeper here. In verse 5, he says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Okay, 
So this death in Christ, in baptism, you know, and you know uh, how they baptized, they would uh, immerse you into the water, so, and, you know, completely, and that would symbolize your death, you are buried. So then you come out of the water, and this is like your resurrection. Right? So you died and you spiritually. I mean, because your body doesn't die. But th something happens spiritually, right? And then you are raised to the new life. Now you are a new person. So now this mystical union with Christ uh, is, is, is very important because uh, when did you die to the sin? In your baptism. You died with him, right? You died with him on the cross. Kind of, he died on our behalf, and then when we are baptizing, we are connect, we, we, through our faith and baptism, we are connecting ourselves to Jesus on the cross. This is where, uh, he, where he destroys all the sin, right? And then because Jesus rose from the dead, we kind of, the same power creates in us new self, right? So now, but the problem is that even after baptism, we keep sinning. Why? What is happening here? Well, they say that the best illustration would be like this. So I will remove circumcision. Oh, maybe I will draw it here. So imagine that in us, our sinful nature is like a tree with deep roots in us. So now when we have the sinful nature in us as a tree, if we do not know Jesus, if we are not born again, if we are not regenerate, so uh, what happens this sinful nature completely dominates us. We cannot resist uh, our sinful nature. You know, our sinful nature and the devil dominate us if we are unbelievers. So the moment you come to Christ, what happens, this, this, these roots are cut off. No more roots. You still have the sinful nature in you, present, but you may overcome it. Now it doesn't have this absolute power over you. Does it make sense? Our old Adam keeps being present in us all our lives. But the difference between Christian and non-Christian is that the old Adam in non-believer has absolute power over that non-believer. But in a Christian, the old Adam can be defeated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, this new person which is created in us can defeat the old Adam. So now when we die to sin, our sinful nature is not completely removed from us, but the root or the roots of the sinful nature are cut off, damaged. So which means we have sinful nature, we have sinful impulses and temptations, but the new person in us that was created is able to overcome those, uh, those uh, sinful impulses. Uh, with the help of, uh, of God, the Holy Spirit, of course. So now Luther, when in his large catechism, he says, if somebody was baptized and then the new person is not growing in him or her, but the old Adam, so this sinful nature, is taking over, this is when baptism becomes empty sign. So now, here Paul continues, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly, certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, and the old self is, is our sinful nature. I mean, the branches are still present. But if you cut off branches, you know, small branches, and make a bouquet and put it in a vase, right? It still can last some time. 
I don't know, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, right? So the same is true for us when this old self is crucified. Crucified means killed, right? You crucify, you kill. So that means uh, it, it doesn't have power over us, but it's still present in us. And it still tempts us, right? But we are called to overcome, to defeat this sinful nature, or as uh, Luther also says, to drown the old Adam. And how do we drown the old Adam? By repentance, right? So we drown. So there is this fight with the old Adam. But the good news is that we can win over the, the, the old Adam. We can. With, with the help of, of the Lord. Okay, so uh, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So which means the, 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 the roots of this body of sin, of this tree of sin, are cut off so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You see, it's not that the sinful nature is completely removed from us, but we may no longer be slaved to, slaves to it. You, you see? So the sinful nature no longer has this absolute power over us. Because if you have the sinful nature without Christ, with deep roots, then you are enslaved to this nature. What happens, the Lord does not completely remove the sinful nature from you, but you may now be free from it. You don't have to be a slave to it. But that would involve some fight, spiritual, spiritual fight. So, no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ <laughs> Jesus. Let no sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passion. So now, your sin is present in your body. You know, sinful nature is present, but you can, you are able now to resist it. Do not let sin to reign in your body. You may allow it to reign, or you may resist it. You may fight this sin. So, for example, you had sin of fornication, now you have lustful desires, do you follow those desires or do you resist them? Or is God able to liberate you? Yes, he is. He, uh, so uh, it, it's a process, you know. Now, this sinful nature um, doesn't have to be your master or cannot be your master. You can resist it now uh, in Christ. So... Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who had been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Your members, right? Your hands, your feet, your members, your body. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience to God, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching, to which you were committed. Standard of teaching is the teaching of Christ. Right? You have committed yourself to the teaching of Christ. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So this is transformation. This is transformation. Uh, 
but what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so now you saw how many times he says you are no longer slaves. You are no lo longer slaves of sin, right? So what he means, he says, well, now you can choose. Before, you couldn't choose. You would by default choose evil and be under the influence of, 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 of the devil, right? You, people naturally by default do not choose God. Okay, so now, now when you are united with Christ, when you have faith in Christ, when you are baptized in Christ, you now die with him and rise again, so now you can choose. Now you are no longer slave to sin. Now you can resist sin. Now you are invited to present your members as slaves to righteousness, obedience to God, right? So this is what Paul is talking about in this, uh, in this section. So we take it seriously. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, let us remember our baptism. Let us remember what happened in our baptism. Uh, let us help us take our baptism seriously so that we have true and living faith in you and we uh, live um, a life that pleases you, a godly life. And also, Jesus, when we are sponsors or when we baptize our children, help us take all the vows, all the promises we make seriously um, so that we can truly bring those children, um, bring them up in the true knowledge and worship of, of you, Jesus. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.